Welcome to AI with AI. That's artificial intelligence with Andy Lachinsky, a podcast from CNA Talks where we discuss the latest breakthroughs and implications in artificial intelligence and autonomy. And if you're listening to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, don't forget to check out our website where we will post all the links that we discussed today. That's cna.org forward slash CAAI. So before we get to our latest and greatest in artificial intelligence and autonomy, be sure to stay tuned. We're going to have a discussion with Russia experts, Sam Bendit and Jeff Edmonds, who will be talking with about the latest Ukraine-Russia conflict and how autonomy is likely to play out in that arena. So stay tuned for that. But with that, Andy, what is the latest and greatest? What do we have for the, uh, the news and the research items today? Well, we're going to be talking about autonomy, so might as well jump right in. And you talk about autonomy, you got to talk about DARPA, right? So oh, yeah. There we go. Two more DARPA programs right off the bat, although this first one is going to be ending pretty soon. So it's a program called Aircrew Labor in Cockpit Automation System, ALIAS. Hmm. And this just happened. There are two flights that happened on February 5th, February 7th. We're recording this on February 18th for, mm -hmm. for timeliness. So what it consisted of is a UH-68, a Black Hawk. Mm -hmm. It was retrofitted with Sikorsky's Matrix technology by Lockheed Martin. Hmm. And this was the first time that it was flown without any backup pilots on board at all. They mm -hmm. had flown it before autonomously, mm -hmm. but there was a pilot. This is the first time, the first two flights, where it was completely pilotless. Mm -hmm. They lasted only a few minutes. The second was like 30 minutes long, but it was mm -hmm. around 4,000 feet. They were cruising around like 110 knots. They performed a bunch of kind of autonomous maneuvers. I mean, they were avoiding buildings in real time, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And the goals of the program, as you might expect, is essentially freeing pilots from flying to think about other tasks and creating safety protections, you know, automatic obstacle avoidance and, and so on. So this was like the latest. I think they have a few more experiments in mind, but the program itself, Alias, is coming to its end at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. And as you might imagine, there are lots of follow-ons. You know, there's nothing mm -hmm. particularly magical about the Black Hawk. There are others right. that they can retrofit, but the technology keeps advancing. Just in case that's not clear, you know, avoiding obstacles in, in real time basically means, right, it's sensing them with its LIDAR and other systems and avoiding rather than having pre- pre-programmed routes around these things. I, I admit, I do like the term optionally piloted vehicle. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's a different way of kind of phrasing that uh, yeah. approach. <laughs> well, here's another DARPA program where I found the phrasing rather interesting. Uh, this one's called RACER. Uh, mm -hmm. That stands for Robotic Autonomy in Complex Environments and Resiliency. So think autonomous vehicles, but in this case, in unspecified kind of rugged terrain. And mm. reading from the DARPA program's page, mm -hmm. this is the wording that I found rather interesting, so I'm gonna quote directly. The goal of the RACER program is to develop and demonstrate new autonomy technologies that enable ground combat vehicles to maneuver in unstructured off-road terrain at speeds mm -hmm. that are no longer limited by the autonomy software or processing time, but only by considerations of sensor limitations, mm. vehicle mechanical limits, mm -hmm. and safety. It goes on to say that at a minimum, the goal of the program is performance at par with a human driver mm. or a teleoperated vehicle should be achieved. So uh, the announcement, this was made on, on 27 January, three teams are going to get funding for the first phase, Carnegie Mellon, uh, NASA JPL, and University of Washington. And DARPA is going to provide each team with a particular vehicle. It'll all be the same. So it's kind of, you know, let, let's see who does what with what. They have the same sensors, the same compute, same software infrastructure, and so on. And if that's a success, the second one is going to use the U.S. Army's Autonomous Platform Demonstrator, the APD. Mm -hmm. That's a monster. That's a six-wheel hybrid electric vehicle. Weighs about 10 tons, and it was designed from the ground up to be unmanned. Hmm. So there are going to be a series of, of field experiments. The first one is, is about to take place, I think, in the April, May timeframe of this year. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, I like the some of the pictures here, including the one of, looks kind of like that robot from the movie, uh, what was it, Johnny Five or whatever it was called? Yeah. little, yeah. I don't know what that is, headset on it. Might that be an insight into what graphic Dave is going to come yeah, up with? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> the next little news item, a rather depressing in some ways report mm. from the National Science Board. Uh, this was released on the 3rd of February. And the title of the report is The State of U.S. Science and Engineering 2022. Mm -hmm. It highlights the changes in the United States uh, research and development performance and kind of the composition of our STEM workforce. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is what's kind of depressing. It essentially finds that the U.S. has continued 
to lose its clear leadership position in global science and engineering. Mm -hmm. As an example of that, even though the U.S. continues to lead the world in annual R&D spending, the share of global R&D fell from like 37% in 2000, 29% in 2010, 27% in 2019, while mm -hmm. China's share increased from 5 to 15 to 22, mm -hmm. and it just kind of marches forward. So without belaboring the statistics, it's actually an interesting report to look at. It's not very long, and it's slickly produced, and it's got nice charts and statistics. But the bottom line is that, and kind of the next steps forward is not so much the leadership, which, as I said, the report kind of concludes we're losing it, mm -hmm. and we should rethink, the U.S. should rethink essentially being a very strong advocate and position ourselves as the keystone in mm -hmm. the global R&D ecosystem. It's a little different mindset. But if you kind of read between the lines and you look at the statistics, well, yeah, I mean, that, that's the reality in the world. And, and we have to be very careful about what our priorities are. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind, because that's going to be the fourth story. Okay. Now, it looks like a lot of the specific data was through 2019, even though this is a 2022 report. Right. So does that, that sort of suggests we haven't seen any potential impacts yet from what COVID has done over the last two years to the U.S. Yeah, that's, that's uh, education point, yeah. system. So I'd be kind of curious how that's going to play out. I tend sometimes to be an optimist. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if th those numbers are going to be any better. Yeah. So speaking of priorities, this is, uh, before we move to, to some quick research items, this is kind of a follow-up to what we did very recently, right? What is this, Podcast 5.9? Mm -hmm. It's on 5.7, five, it's only a few weeks ago. We summarized DOD's Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, Heidi mm -hmm. Shoes. Remember, she had her technology priorities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And our summary at that time was just based on some secondhand accounts because I, I never actually saw the talk. I don't think it's available on, on YouTube, let's say. Mm -hmm. But she gave a talk at the Potomac Officers Club back on January 19th. Well, she alluded to the fact that there was going to be a document that's going to be released. Mm -hmm. And so the follow-up item is that the document has indeed been released. In fact, there's an accompanying one from the White House uh, that I'll get to in a second. And it just gives more meat on what she was able to say kind of in public mm -hmm. and what the press reported on. And by meat, I mean, there are 14 critical technology areas mm -hmm. and they're grouped into three categories, which mm -hmm. was not something that we were privy to in the earlier story. Seed areas of emerging opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, which include biotechnology, quantum science, future generation wireless technology and advanced materials. The larger one is the effective adoption areas where there's an existing vibrant commercial sector activity mm -hmm. within which you have things like trusted AI, autonomy, mm -hmm. human machine interfaces, and then defense specific areas in directed energy, hypersonics, and so on. Mm -hmm. I alluded to another report. The White House released a report by a so-called Fast Track Action Subcommittee on Critical Emerging Technologies. This is the National Science and Technology Council. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how like explicitly aligned they are. Clearly, they're all stemming from the same administration. So you would expect there to be an alignment of critical technologies. There's a take for DOD and there's a broader take. This is kind of a broader take and it takes a deeper dive. So the list that you'll find in this accompanying report from the White House, it includes 19 core technologies. All of the ones that are on Heidi Shoes list are of course there, although Interestingly, they're not all necessarily phrased the same way, which I <laughs> sure. find kind of curious. Yeah. And there are others that are not there, but each one of those categories, each one of the 19 uh, core technologies from the White House report, it also takes kind of loosely speaking a deep dive in the sense that there's a subcategorization, like in artificial intelligence, there's a main category, mm -hmm. but then the White House report drills a little deeper and includes things like sensory perception, recognition, mm -hmm. planning, reasoning. So you kind of see how, how that... Um, how that appears kind of in, in a broader context. Mm -hmm. So overall, you're not going to learn much except the importance, at least for me, lay in the fact that, well, these are literally the critical technologies mm -hmm. moving forward, both on the DOD side and, and slightly higher. So if you want to see how they're organized and how this current administration is thinking about them, these are two documents that you can go to. All right, there we go. I noticed one of the particular ones that seems to have the, the widest terminology usage is either quantum information technologies or quantum science. I think we also hear quantum computing technologies a lot. Clearly the key there is quantum. I guess it's everything surrounding it. But there you go. Check out those resources. That'll give you a better indication of what, what they're actually talking about. So before we get to the interview, a couple of quick, really interesting research items. So the first one is from OpenAI. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know all about GPT-3 and all those other things. So this one is about aligning language models to follow instructions better. Hmm. And it's actually an interesting attempt. Uh, you can think of it. I'll describe it in a second. Of 
kind of layering bits of machine learning on themselves to make the machine learning that you're really interested in, in this case, a language model to perform better. And by mm -hmm. better, I mean all of the difficulties that we continue seeing, right, about the, the output of these models. So what right. OpenAI did is they, they essentially put together a three-step process where it consists mostly of fine tuning by human experts and, and human labelers mm -hmm. and coming up with a model that that's more in line, hence the aligning language models with what we actually want these models to do. So OpenAI hired a group of 40 human reviewers and they proceeded down a track of basically three steps. So if I can summarize them, this is kind of gross in, in the short time we have. So you first collect, or they collected a data set of human written demonstrations on prompts that they sample from whatever prompt data uh, set they have. And they mm -hmm. use that to train supervised learning baselines where human labelers, they kind of go in and they demonstrate what the actual desired output should be. That's the data that's used to initially fine tune the otherwise freestanding GPT-3. Okay, so that's step one. Mm -hmm. Step mm -hmm. two, they then collect the data set of human label comparisons between two model outputs and a labeler, a human labeler, ranks the output from best to worst. Mm. That data is used to train what's called a reward model to basically predict which outputs the labelers would prefer. Mm -hmm. The final mm -hmm. step is to use that reward model as a reward function to again fine tune the GPT-3 policy to essentially maximize that reward. So. Mm -hmm. It's a couple set, right, of machine learning algorithms. It's essentially using reinforcement learning from human feedback. The method mm -hmm. itself is not new, but this is the first time, uh, certainly that OpenAI claims that it's been used for something as massive as a GPT-3. Right. So what's the bottom line without going into details after <laughs> they do this? Well, when they compare it, and it shouldn't be surprising because you're fine tuning a model and you're using the responses of the humans. And by the way, I, I should be clear on that. What, what are the humans asked to do? Well. As we know, GPT-3 can produce rather disturbing output. So the humans mm -hmm. are trying to guard against that. So if it has mm -hmm. violent language or sexual language or it denigrates mm -hmm. a specific group, they're obviously going to put a thumbs down. And the mm -hmm. fine tuning should, in principle, take care of that. And right. the resulting model they called Instruct GPT, and this is going to be the default model moving forward, mm -hmm. that when they ask humans to compare the output, for, by the way, a relatively small model compared to the original 175 billion GPT-3, the Instruct GPT model only has about 1.3 billion parameters. Mm -hmm. Despite that, with the fine tuning, with the process that, that I kind of outlined, humans prefer the output of the smaller Instruct GPT variant 70% of the time. It has literally 100 fewer parameters. That's kind of neat. So they're on to something. The limitations, they're also careful to point out. Look, it's just the first stab. It can still generate a lot of to toxic output. And in fact, if you think about it, despite the fact that they're doing everything that one would expect one to do, you're trying to use additional data, in this case, honest human reviewers to, to kind of filter out all the bad stuff. Well, mm -hmm. since Instruct GPT is fundamentally designed to be really adept at aligning its output with what people ask it to do. Mm -hmm. Well, it has the seeds for doing something potentially even worse than GPT-3 itself can do, right? right? If that's the desire of the individual. So right. yep. there yep. are interesting embedded issues within this. But as mm -hmm. a basic research effort, I mean, I, there's a part mm -hmm. of me that kind of feels before releasing GPT-3 into the public and all that hoopla, remember, first, we're not going to release oh, it, right. then we're going to release it. Maybe it's, this is yeah. something that should have been done before anything was released, mm -hmm. but that, mm -hmm. that's just one opinion. But it is interesting research nonetheless. Yeah, I, I noticed right aside from the fact that it can it can still generate the toxic outputs or you know the, the, the sort of unwanted stuff, it'll still make up facts, right? right. I mean, th again, th this is just a language model that's matching you know most likely next word and ideas. And it's it's going to kind of spit out whatever it, it wants. So you still have those issues. And like you said, right, I think we've all gotten used to interacting with a search engine mm -hmm. and re refining our the, what we type in that search engine box to kind of get towards more what we're actually looking for. This sort of strikes me as that it's it's a where you're layering on another model to kind of help you fine tune so you actually get the output you want. But maybe we'll see more of this and maybe they'll be able to maybe train it a little bit better to reduce those more undesirable outputs. Yeah, so stay tuned. Uh, yeah. A second story, again, we can't do justice in, in the short time we have, but this is from DeepMind. Mm -hmm. And remember, I, I don't remember exactly when we talked about it, but sometime last year, OpenAI released its Codex, GPT-3 oh, yeah. powered, remember? And it was an AI model for translating natural language commands into source code. 
And it's actually implemented in a real neat way, the OpenAI product, if I remember correctly, kind of in a hybrid yeah. approach. You're, you're using it as an adjunct, as, as a programmer. Well, DeepMind has stepped into the same waters with something they claim outdoes it. They've introduced mm -hmm. AlphaCode, which they claim on their blog, it's a system that can write competition level code. By competition, yeah. they mean it's a platform for programming contests called Code Forces. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a new data set called Code Contest that include various mm -hmm. problems, solutions, test cases, and so on. That's where they actually put this up against. Like OpenAI's effort, although not using GPT-3, it's, it's still a transformer-based language model. Mm -hmm. Some of its interesting virtues or statistics are, like Codex, it has something like 715 gigabytes or so for a training data set, which is roughly equivalent to Codex. And it's essentially a snapshot various public repository and GitHub and so on. Mm -hmm. It has roughly four times the number of parameters of Codex. Uh, Alpha Code has like a little over 41 billion parameters. Mm -hmm. And so the bottom line is when they've unleashed it on this code context contests <laughs> under code forces, that mm -hmm. it ranked in the top 54% in code forces competitions. And it was able mm -hmm. to solve over 34% of the problems. So you read that, and I wish I, I had uh, taken the time to write some of the clickbaity titles, and, and you can imagine, right? Uh, you know, DeepMind's oh, yeah. new AI, it puts programmers out of, uh, out of work. Yeah, right. There are a lot of caveats. The best one of which perhaps I've seen is the co-author with Gary Marcus. Remember the book we, we had as a book of, of the week at one point, Rebooting AI? Uh, Ernest yeah. Davis, he put on his uh, website, an interesting analysis that we'll provide a link to, but he essentially points out, listen, this is kind of equivalent to the same kind of things we see with GPT-3 and other types uh, of language systems being used to produce uh, text. It's kind of good, and you've been making mm -hmm. this point all along, right? It's kind of good for a few sentences, and then it starts falling apart. Mm -hmm. Well, the massive caveat here is the various examples that, yeah, it placed in the top 54%. Objectively speaking, that's true. We're talking about 20-line programs. And to do that, here's the really big caveat. Alpha code creates a massive amount of C++, Python, whatever code of examples to kind of choose from and select the best. Literally millions of samples mm. per problem. I mean, it kind of reminds me of the old mm. IBM Deep Blue, right? Bru the, 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 the brute force approach for chess rather than mm. any, any real smarts. And so Ernest, Ernest right, Davis right. speculates, look, it's, it's reasonable to assume that if you scale the problem up, it's going to scale exponentially with the number of samples you're going to need. Mm. To produce a 200 mm. line program is going to require something like 10 to the mm. 60 of power samples. What are we really accomplishing here? Not to denigrate what, mm -hmm. what alpha code does, because it's again, you know, right. it, it's going to continue evolving, but let's kind of interpret it on the level in which it, it needs to be interpreted. This is not a panacea solution to anything, but it is remarkably interesting work. Mm. Yeah, no, I appreciate that sort of more um, sober look at kind of the results. I, I have to admit the statement that this was competition level code made me laugh because if I ran a beauty contest with 5,000 participants and you placed 200 and, you know, right in the middle of that pack, would you call yourself a competition level beauty? Right. I don't think so. So, you know, again, not, not to lessen right. the impact right. of what they've done, but it's not perhaps as, as big as it might seem as well. All right. To, to round out these stories very quick. Another deep mind, we're not going to say much about it except what it is. Uh, the details are really complicated, but it, it kind of says it all in the title. Deep mind, along with EPFL Swiss Plasma Center, announced just a few days ago, 16th of February, that they've essentially been able to, using reinforcement learning algorithms, to control nuclear fusion. That's hmm. amazing. The challenge in, the, in, the, in this research is to shape and maintain a high temperature plasma within the tokamak mm -hmm. vessel that's used for, mm -hmm. for the fusion, at least for some models, they've successfully applied reinforcement learning to this. It's a remarkable mm -hmm. uh, achievement. So please wow. just follow the links and, and kind of read up on it. Mm -hmm. The survey of the week is called Towards a Science of Human AI Decision-Making, a survey of empirical studies. And it's just that. It's the first one that I've seen. It's really neat. You know, we talk about AI. We talk about how humans kind of interact with AI. This is the first concerted effort. It's really filled with so many insights from a variety of researchers. It, well, it, it is a survey. It's only in the last two years or so that the research literature has kind of exploded on 
that gulf, right, on the human side and the AI side, but working together mm -hmm. as decision support, as assistance, as uh, uh, creative engines, right? And so what the survey does is examine all of that across a broad spectrum of, of domains from, from medicine to finance to law to, uh, to military stuff. So if you're interested in what exists in the world where humans and AI work together, in a decision-making kind of uh, situation. This is the survey to go to. It's, it's, it's a really nice mm -hmm. summary. And yeah. we'll close out before going to the interview with a video that I only saw the first fragment of. It's about 14, 15 minutes long. Mm -hmm. I saw the first five minutes. You said you saw this, the whole thing. So I'll let you introduce it. It's called Time Lapse of Artificial <laughs> Intelligence 2028 to the year 3000. Right. Yeah. This is put forth by Venture City. It's a documentary kind of looking how the next thousand years will play out with artificial intelligence. As you might imagine, it, it's an interesting take. It steps initially, you know, pretty slowly through the years and then hits decades and then eventually it goes a little bit faster. But right as time goes along, it's postulating as to when we're going to see certain things come online, such as artificial general intelligence. How will the fusion and interaction with humans happen, right? There's a human AI conflict that happens around 2060. And then, right, then the uploading starts happening in the late 2000s, you know, towards 2100. And then apparently by that time, right, world hunger and, and war are solved and, and things just start marching forward as AI sort of mostly takes over and humans are interacting with it. And you can see the influences from books like Max Tegmark's Life 3.0 and other things about the far future, especially towards the end as the universe itself starts to come alive, right? There's a Dyson sphere that gets constructed around the sun somehow by the end of 2200 or 2300. There's a lot of just kind of, if you're really interested in, in sci-fi related stuff, it's again, an interesting take on what the future might look like. I think it's overly optimistic. It's great entertainment for a, a mid-morning coffee snack. <laughs> it is. There's a lot of fun graphics. I mean, some of them are, you know, just very strange videos like where did they pull this from but then there's a, just some neat videos of things happening and so it's it's fun to watch so check it out and and kind of make your own judgment on what you think the likelihood of this this actually happening are okay and that'll do it and uh, stay tuned for a real neat interview that's right we'll be back after a short break to have a discussion with sam bennett and jeff edmonds we'll be talking about the role of autonomy in the ukraine russia conflict hi i'm sawyer judge a research analyst and game designer with CNA's gaming program. War games and workshops are great tools for tackling our sponsors' most complex problems. We create the scenarios and the structures that enable our participants to understand how decisions made today result in possible tomorrows. We can't predict the future, but we can help you be ready for it. If you're interested in learning more about our work and how we would tailor our craft to meet your most pressing research questions, please visit our website at cna.org slash wargaming. Well, Andy, the big global news at the moment is certainly the conflict in Ukraine. A few weeks back at the beginning of February, CNA's Russia program analysts published a paper titled Russian Military Autonomy in a Ukraine Conflict. To provide us some insight on how autonomy might play out in this conflict, We've invited back our Russia program experts for a discussion. So welcome back to Sam Bendit. Thanks so much. And also to Jeff Edmonds. Thanks for having me. All right, thank you both for being here. Now for our listeners, we're recording this discussion on Tuesday, the 22nd of February at 1.15 Eastern. The latest news is that Russia has recognized two separatist regions in Ukraine and that Russian troops have entered Eastern Ukraine. Russian lawmakers have approved the use of military force abroad, while EU foreign ministers have unanimously adopted sanctions against Russia. And President Biden has moved up by one hour his remarks on Ukraine, which should be happening right now. So with that as backdrop, over to you, Sam and Jeff. What does Russia have in its inventory when it comes to autonomy, and how might they use it in this conflict? Well. Over the last decade, Russian military has embarked on a very significant modernization drive, which included investment in and development of multiple types of military autonomous and robotic systems. We should make caveat here that uh, when Russia talks about military autonomy or unmanned systems, it's actually talking about remote controlled vehicles. Almost all of its UAVs, unmanned ground vehicles, and maritime uh, systems are actually remote controlled. 
Uh, at the same time, Russian military likes to use the term autonomy and robotics. So we're going to go along with, with what the Russian military has been saying. Uh, the paper was based on open source public information. It was based on announcements and research and analysis of what the Russian military has in its arsenal so far. And at this point, Russian military has, I think, the second largest working military UAV fleet with approximately 2,000 or so UAVs. Um, they range anywhere from 10 kilometers, which is, which is very, uh, very tactical model, up to 120 to 200 kilometers for some of the newer models. Russian military also has been developing and testing a number of unmanned ground vehicles uh, for demining, for combat operations, for clearing unexploded ordnance. And the Russian military has also been investing heavily in the development of different types of unmanned underwater and surface vehicles. Uh, one underlying uh, notion for all of the technologies that we list in the paper is that they were actually tested in Syria. Russian military claims that over 300 different types of weapon systems were used by its military in Syria starting in 2015. Unmanned aerial vehicles actually were tested repeatedly and on a daily basis, and they became an integral part uh, of Russian operations. The same goes for unmanned ground vehicles, as well as unmanned maritime military systems. And so uh, in the Russian arsenal today, uh, there are uh, at least 20 or so different types of military robotic technologies that they could potentially utilize in Ukraine. And this is something that we've actually listed in our paper. Can you give us a, a little bit of an idea of how, of, of how these will be used? I mean, obviously there are lots of different systems we can get into some specific ones, but kind of what is the general plan moving forward? They're not going to be like piecemeal, right? Or a robot here, or a UAV there. They're going to be networked in some way, performing surveillance, maybe targeting. So can you kind of step us through what, what Russia's plan might be? Right. Most of the UAVs that Russian military is going to utilize are actually tactical intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance UAVs or ISRs. So they're going to be integrated with Russian battalions. They're going to be integrated with smaller and larger military formations. They're going to be integrated with artillery, multiple launch rocket systems. They're going to be integrated with infantry and practically every military service, essentially to provide situational and informational awareness as well as to form other duties. And actually, I will let Jeff describe that in more detail. Uh, when it comes to unmanned ground vehicles, as I mentioned, Russian military sappers may use them for clearing unexploded ordnance, for demining operations around places where Russian military intends to fight. And when it comes to maritime unmanned underwater vehicles, they will be used in small numbers, but as well providing intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities for the Russian Navy, for the Marines, for other services. In other words, trying to see what is happening below and above the waves. Jeff, over to you. Yeah, so when we're thinking about how Russia uses something like autonomy and UAVs in particular, I mean, they've obviously observed the fact that armies across the world are using these from very simple ones to, you know, the extremely complex ones that the United States uses and have really, I mean, experimentally pushed into new areas um, or just every area they can using UAVs. But I think an important point that Sam brought up is their use in essentially what I would call battle space information management, right? So Information dominance is a cornerstone of Russian military strategy, which is a big change from what it was during the Soviet Union. Um, the Soviet military was more of a brawler. It would, if it actually grabbed onto you, it, it could do quite a bit of damage, but it couldn't see very well. And the Russians observed our emphasis on information dominance and really decided to pursue that on their own. And so they've really looked to drones to improve their battle space awareness. And one thing they often talk about are these things called reconnaissance fire and strike complexes. They're also called contours. The word doesn't translate very well to an equivalent U.S. military term. But it's really a reference to a grouping of various sensors and strike platforms with integrated sharing networks. Um, the whole point of this is to increase you know, the potential ability to produce effective fires, reduce what they would call the reconnaissance destruction cycle, and just really, you know, improve one, your ability to see the battlefield and your ability to do what you want to do on the battlefield. And so I think that's really become important. And I think, you know, they've already, as someone say, they've already integrated a lot of these systems into their military. And we'll see a lot of the standard ones being used, I'm sure. But I also kind of believe that armies just in general try to use as much as they can in a conflict, whether they need to or not. 
And so I think we might see some experimental type platforms and Sam might be able to touch on that. But I, you know, I think that these are going to play a major role in any kind of ground offensive. Well, one, they're going to play a role in the East where it is now. And if the Russians do indeed, much of the rest of the country will see UAVs playing a major role there. That was kind of going to be my follow-up question. Like right now, I think Putin has said that it's mostly a peacekeeping force, right? It's not a full invasion. In fact, I guess President Biden is going to announce something like in our view, it's the beginning of an invasion, but the point is it's not full on. Are there differences for us to keep track of by way of use of UAVs and so on between peacekeeping and a full full invasion? I don't know that there, there is. I think you're going to see the same systems because in, in the East right now, there are a bunch of false flag operations claiming that Ukrainians are attacking Russians. And so you might see UAVs there you know, without sidetracking away from autonomy, they, there's really kind of two schools of thought as to whether or not they're going to invade. Um, I think most of those on the on the Russia team here believe that Putin has not gotten what he wants and, and will broaden the conflict. And I think there you'll start to see much more use of these drones. Mm-hmm. But I think it might be kind of hard from an unmanned basis to be able to use that as an indicator as to whether or not they're going to do operations more broadly. I don't know, Sam, what do you think? I, I think the biggest issue that we watch for is the intensity of the use of, for example, unmanned area vehicles to provide situational awareness. I want to add that over the past decade, the use of UAVs especially became practically organic to many Russian military formations, to many units, to many services. They are actually an integral part of ISR capabilities, providing intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. And so even this week, as the Russian forces are deployed near Ukraine, there are, uh, there are a large number of exercises and drills happening elsewhere in Russia, where unmanned aerial vehicles are a key part to what Jeff mentioned as the reconnaissance fire, reconnaissance strike contour, and as a key intelligence asset. So uh, the official descriptions of these exercises usually cite an Orlon 10 UAV, which is kind of like the workhorse of the Russian fleet, as well as other UAVs are providing ground coverage information on the adversarial assets and many other sort of uh, useful data points for the Russian military to consider before it launches a strike. So if this situation switches from peacekeeping to combat, we're going to see more UAVs in the air. We're going to see a combination of UAVs. One other interesting point that we uh, were tracking and that we mentioned in the paper is the evolution of some of these purely ISR unmanned aerial vehicles platforms to actual combat capacity. What the Russian military has learned in Syria and what the world has actually learned is that any UAV, any hobbyist UAV, any small UAV can actually become a combat UAV if it could be rigged uh, to drop munitions. Uh, And this has happened to the Russians as they encountered these do-it-yourself combat UAVs. It has been happening to other services and not just in the Middle East. And so Russian military has been investing in the capacity and practicing the capacity of dropping small munitions from its ISR UAVs. And so if this switches from peacekeeping to combat, we're going to see some of these smaller ISR models actually being rigged to combat capacity. And I think that's when we learn that Russian military has switched its tactics. So, Andy, I want to go back and revise my, my answer to you a bit, thinking about what Sam just said. And so far as the Ukrainians would be able to, one, detect certain longer range UAVs and be able to collate that that data in some kind of useful manner, it, you know, in, in coordination with us or with our own intelligence means, it might give you a hint or a clue as to the major axes that the Russians would use to invade, because there, there are several different scenarios out there and several different directions. And so if all of a sudden you had a large uptick in reconnaissance UAVs coming out of Crimea in a certain direction, um, you might, you know, make the assumption that there's some planning going on there or that the Russians are getting ready to move there. Right. Uh, yeah, an interesting point. Yeah. So, Sam, you mentioned some things that suggest this is really an all domain battle, right, it, which may be slightly different from what we saw in Syria in that we're going to have the Russian fleet involved as well with the Black Sea. What would we likely see them be using from the unmanned system perspective? Uh, are you referencing maritime systems or uh, just in general? just in general. So uh, we're going to see its main model used for intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, and possibly even uh, for dropping small munitions. That's 
an Aileron 3, as well as another model, Orlon 10. We may see Granat UAVs, which is another tactical ISR UAV that was uh, used widely in Syria. We're going to see Tachyon and Zastava UAVs, which also provide a coverage within a radius of approximately 100 kilometers or less. We're going to see an electronic warfare version of Orlan 10 called Lear 3. This system has been tested extensively in Russia. It is a key part of Russia's electronic warfare offense and defense capability. Uh, it was sighted in eastern Ukraine. It was tested in Syria. It was seen in Nagorno-Karabakh, as well as Kazakhstan, where the Russian forces were deployed. We may see some of Russia's newer combat UAVs like Orion, which supposedly were tested in Syria and today remains Russia's uh, sole main combat UAV with a radius of up to 250 kilometers. We may see its limited use if Russian military goes on the offensive and if combat actually breaks out. We may also see Russian military test and utilize its two loitering munition models, Kub and Lancet. Those models were tested in Syria as well, and the Russian military is very keen to acquire such loitering munitions in large numbers. Russian military watched with surprise and worry as a mid-sized power like Azerbaijan utilized loitering munitions with great success to degrade Armenian military capabilities, and it wants these systems essentially yesterday. Uh, we may also see Zala, which is a UAV brand manufactured by Kalashnikov, which is in turn owned by Rostec. Russia's largest defense industrial corporation. Uh, we may see Zala UAVs, quadrocopters, and multi-rotor UAVs used. Uh, Russian military has been practicing with using UAVs not just to land but at sea, and so there have been several instances where Russian military vessels were launching Orlan 10 UAVs from deck in order to gain situational and informational awareness. And when it comes to demining capabilities and mine clearance capabilities, as well as firefighting capabilities. Russian military will use Uran-6 unmanned ground vehicle. Those uh, UGVs were seen extensively in Syria, especially in the demining of the Aleppo region in Syria. Uran-14 firefighting vehicle will be used. The Russian sappers and engineering forces may use, uh, may use smaller Scarab and Sfera uh, UGVs for gaining situational awareness, especially in urban combat through the rubble. And when it comes to maritime capabilities, uh, we cite Two specific models in the paper, one that has been cited as a, a remote control ISR unmanned underwater vehicle that the Russian Navy uses on ships, as well as by its uh, naval special forces in the Marines. It's called Marlin 350. They may use Galtel unmanned underwater vehicle, which supposedly can operate autonomously. This was tested in Syria. And they may use another system called Diamond, which is made up of ISR and combat unmanned underwater and surface vehicles. So this is kind of like a short list of capacity that Russian military has utilized itself, that it announced in drills and exercises, that it announced in Syria and in other regions where it is deploying. Sam, can I ask you about the other side? I mean, Ukraine has plenty of drones in its arsenal as well. So how, how do they stack up? Well, that's, it's a great question. And yes, Ukraine does have a drone fleet itself. It is much smaller than Russian because Russian military has benefited from years of building and fielding such system. It benefited from an earlier Ministry of Defense MOD policy that placed an emphasis on testing and evaluation and acquisition of these drones. So uh, Ukrainian military has ISR UAVs, but it has also been acquiring loitering munition and a small scale tactical UAVs as well. Uh, Ukrainian military and its volunteer battalions, which will probably be important in any combat with Russia, also have sort of hobbyist drones that have been rigged to perform ISR and uh, small-scale combat functions as well. But on the whole, when it comes to quantity and quality, the Russian UAV fleet, of course, is much bigger, uh, much more professional, and may present a very clear danger for the Ukrainian forces and Ukrainian defenders. So as this conflict continues to unfold, uh, clearly, you know, going back to comments you made in your opening statement, where you highlighted that most of these capabilities are actually remote controlled and the word autonomy gets thrown around a little bit loosely sometimes. What are th some things we can be looking out for or, or keeping our ears open for to kind of understand what is actually happening? I mean, it's not just UAVs, You're, you know, they have a number of different systems, command and control systems that they've been practicing with. And they've tried to work AI and autonomy into their considerable electronic warfare capabilities. So it's going to be interesting to see them 
you know, deconflict those and use those in concert where they haven't had to do it as much in Syria and Ukraine as they have before. Militaries tend to try new things when they have the opportunity in combat. And so I think it'll be interesting, interesting to see which of these, you know, more experimental UAVs, like the one Sam mentioned, you know, that are launched in the back of, of ships. And you have a small area like the Sea of Basel, those might be particularly handy. And so I think it'll be really interesting to see how those are used. All right. Well, any other final things that we should be looking for as this conflict continues to unfold? Nothing specific. I think um, this may be uh, a conflict that would be way too familiar for the Russian military. They were unofficially present in eastern Ukraine for years. Ukrainian volunteers have sighted numerous types of Russian UAVs downed in uh, eastern Ukraine. And so uh, Russian military has a very, I would say, good knowledge of what eastern Ukraine is like, of what the Donbass area is like, what the eastern parts of Ukraine are like. And so if UAVs and other military systems are used in this conflict against Ukrainian forces, Russian military would use them based on a years long familiarity with the terrain, with the cities, with the forces that they're going to encounter. And so this is going to be a very intense conflict if it actually breaks out. At the same time, both sides are going to try and use more advanced capacity like unmanned aerial vehicles for ISR in order to gain better situational and informational awareness. And from a, a purely objective standpoint, it would be interesting to see which side succeeds in providing its forces with better capacity. One contrasting point to that, I mean, I agree that when it becomes more static, that's what they've been used to. What the Russian military has not done In many ways, what they're going to do, if they do expand the conflict in Ukraine, they'll be doing something they didn't do in most of their strategic exercises, which is absorb an aerospace attack from the United States and then grab some land and then a trip backwards. This is actually the opposite, where in all likelihood, if they expand, they'll conduct their own brief aerospace campaign of, you know, and UAVs will be part of that, but long range strike. Um, against critical command and control nodes and military units before they actually, you know, begin a ground offensive. And so I think it's going to be interesting to see how they can use UAVs in a very fluid forward movement type, you know, they refer to these as, as, in, as engagements and how on a battlefield where you have multiple, you know, many different battalions and, and armies moving at the same time, how they're able to coordinate all of these different ISR assets to actually get a, an accurate picture of what's going on. All right. Well, Sam, Jeff, we really do appreciate your time and insights to talk on this topic. Again, that paper is Russian Military Autonomy in a Ukraine Conflict. You can check that out on CNA's website. We'll provide the link in our show notes. Jeff, Sam, again, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. All right. Well, if you're listening to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, don't forget to check out our website where we will post all the links that we discussed today. That's cna.org forward slash C-A-A-I. But I, for one, welcome our new computer overlords. Thanks as always, Andy. I'll see you next time. Sounds good.